All right, so welcome everyone. It is uh, great to have you with us here today. This is Scott White with Clear Data, and uh, joining me is Chris Bowen. I'm going to provide uh, an introduction to Chris for you all. Um, uh, Chris and I have uh, known each other for over 10 years now, and I've been had the pleasure of being a customer of Chris's. He is the founder of uh, Clear Data and serves as our leader over all of our security, privacy, and compliance. Uh, Chris has led uh, privacy and compliance and security efforts for healthcare organizations across the globe. So all over the world, hundreds and hundreds of customers. Chris has uh, presented the Healthcare Lawyers Association and um, at High Trust and uh, truly is a distinguished expert in this field. And I think you'll uh, enjoy um, his uh, well-informed perspectives that we have today. So welcome, Chris, thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank you. And I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Scott, if, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, Scott, a dear friend, um, really a great asset in the healthcare mission that Clear Data has. He's a veteran leader in large health systems uh, former president or former uh, CIO of Ch Phoenix Children's Hospital. He's got a, a deep knowledge of HL7. He was part of the group that helped to uh, found the clinical genomics special interest group within H HL7. In fact, we were in uh, Germany just a, a recently, just before the COVID issue became a worldwide pandemic. And uh, as we were driving through Germany, he indicated that uh, this is where he was before when he was working on some of the HL7 work. It's, it's really a, a pleasure to work with Scott. He also co-chairs the, uh, or, or was the co-chair of the California HIE Cal eConnect Technology Advisory Group. But really he's just an expert at understanding the patient, understanding the empathy required in healthcare technology. And Scott, it's a pleasure to be uh, having this webinar with you today. Okay, well, thank you, Chris. And um, before we, we get into the details of the agenda, I want to let you know that we will have time for questions and answers at the end of our uh, discussion that Chris and I will have with you. Uh, you can just type in your questions into the Q&A field at the icon at the bottom of the screen. And if for some reason we can't get to all of those questions, uh, please know that Chris and I will send out some blog information uh, to answer those. So we're excited to hear from you. So please keep those uh, questions coming. So with that, let's dive in. We are excited today to talk about this uh, very important topic of, of security, compliance, privacy in the, in the time of COVID. And even just this morning was talking with um, a pharmaceutical organization uh, in Europe. So it was up very early uh, for me in order to speak with them about pressing ahead with drug research and developing new therapies. So we have that thread of healthcare work that, that must go on in order to uh, take care of patients. And at the same time, just a short time ago, I was talking with a friend and colleague who leads um, a large uh, accountable care portion uh, of a, a large healthcare delivery system, and he had to furlough 90% of his staff. So there are great stresses and challenges within healthcare now as we deal with this uh, global pandemic of COVID. Um, but even with that, our, uh, our responsibilities, uh, legal and ethical responsibilities to safeguard patient data, those don't go away. So let's, let's dig in to the issues about both HIPAA um, and GDPR and understand the very serious consequences, the price that, that we have to pay if, if we don't pay attention to those issues. Um, uh, let's also look at uh, where uh, there may be uh, particularly difficulties in, in meeting these standards as you apply them to the cloud and, and where it may be right to um, call out for help and uh, think about some mistakes that uh, many of us make as we're, we're wrestling with HIPAA, privacy, security, and compliance, and, um, and then uh, offer some suggestions for that third-party help. So looking forward to it. Um, as we uh, dig in, and you know, this is something we, we see the spike proteins. I think most of us here on the call would recognize this. Who, who would have thought even just a, a few short weeks ago that we would have any idea 
what this photograph represents, but now it um, is enemy in terms of this global pandemic um, has caused uh, so much illness and death. And, uh, and it has also caused some, um, some unique or surfaced some really unique challenges related to privacy, security, and compliance uh, for healthcare. And uh, really eager, Chris, for you to um, help us understand some of these uh, unique issues that we are facing in this, uh, in this time of COVID. Uh, I think many of us have seen even on the news, and, and again, I've spoken with some of my uh, provider colleagues. Uh, in fact, in even Clear Data, we have helped organizations set up care delivery facilities in tents or in parking garages. And um, we've seen folks wanted to accelerate the implementation of, of, of solutions. Um, and eager to hear, Chris, from you, your thoughts about uh, this landscape in, in the time of COVID. Yeah, thank you, Scott. It's interesting. The uh, briefings that I have set on, uh, that you've set on as well, Scott, some of them have uh, addressed some supply chain concerns. Uh, you've probably read about uh, well-meaning uh, hospital systems and healthcare providers reaching out to get supplies. Ventilators were a big concern. So that was a, a really big concern. One of the leading physicians in the state of New York actually cited an example of uh, ventilators that would come without the actual hoses. And so they had to get very creative when what they did was they actually used garden hoses. They put garden hoses, attached them to the ventilators to help in those really tough areas of the front lines. Uh, Scott, you mentioned rapid clinical expansion. Uh, another briefing that I set on included uh, information around, you know, the, the doctors that would come and help on the front lines and they would jump in and try to, to, to help as much as they could. I asked one of the physicians, did you have to make any trade-offs uh, from, a, from a training perspective, from a security perspective? And his answer was interesting. He said, look, we value human life above all. And so we did. We had to make some trade-offs in some of the training that we did with some of the onboarding of the physicians. And We'd give them a password and say, get to work. And so it was a, it's, a, it's been interesting to see that. I, I think privacy has been an, another topic that's been very interesting. Uh, you know, some countries in the world have actually uh, scaled back some of the privacy protections, particularly in the eastern parts of the European Union um, in, in other countries where they've actually said, we can go search your phone and go do some contract, contact tracing. Hold on one second, Scott, if you could take that. Sorry about that. Somebody decided to uh, do some air duct work uh, while we're doing this, so I apologize. But certain other cyber threats, including uh, phishing, uh, spear phishing, they have ramped up. Some of the bad guys in the world have decided they want to take advantage of of stealing money from hospital systems or, or other kinds of, of outcomes that are just absolutely devastating in the, in the face of a pandemic. So uh, yeah, I, I'd say there's a lot of different concerns around the world in terms of privacy, security, supply chain, ex expansion of needs for clinical um, uh, adeptness. So Scott, I, I think we're going to talk about HIPAA next, am I right? Yeah. So before we get into some of the more um, uh, the details of these challenges, I think it's important to set the foundation to uh, to talk about what is HIPAA, and um, we we see that it is legislation that was passed in 1996, and it's interesting. This element of uh, privacy or security actually isn't even in the title of the legislation, it was really related to uh, portability and insurance portability was a, which a huge emphasis in the exchange of electronic information. And uh, the privacy piece was, uh, and security and compliance was a, was a piece that was added, uh, although important within that legislation. And um, Chris, can you, can you share some additional highlights about this foundation and important knowledge that we need to, to, to have uh, for HIPAA? Yeah, I mean, HIPAA is, is a 
fascinating law. I mean, a lot of people think it's really, really difficult to comply with HIPAA. And certainly, depending on where you're at in the in the supply chain or in the in the care delivery continuum, it, it can be. Um, but there are there are certain restrictions that were actually lifted during the uh, peak of the of the pandemic. Some of these included um, uh, making sure that uh, uh, telemedicine was was being useful in helping to treat patients at the time of of, uh, of need when the disease was just at its peak or just as it was starting to peak. Um, but healthcare technology, if you think about some of the cloud technologies that are out there and the services that are innovated uh, over the year, uh, Amazon with an unwieldy amount of innovation, around 1,900 services uh, that have been improved, enhanced, changed, or delivered or created in the past year, year and a half, if you take that and you combine it with uh, the need to comply with HIPAA, it's, it's a daunting task. It's a daunting thing to keep up with. And it requires expert, determine, expert opinions around how to make a, a cloud service compliant, how to make it work within healthcare. And, uh, and certainly uh, adhering to the rules, adhering to uh, security threats and, and how to adhere to your responsibilities around notification when something goes wrong. Very, very important to the privacy and the security of the patients that we uh, get involved with So, uh, as a healthcare system. Um, so yeah, I would say on its surface, privacy, security, breach declaration, that seems to be an easy thing to talk about, but when it gets into practice, Scott, it becomes really quite challenging. Yeah, no, I, I experienced that um, personally, as a provider executive, many of this, those, those systems throughout the country have grown by mergers and acquisitions, and there's legacy systems that they didn't set up, and there may not be the institutional knowledge, and uh, lots of technical complexity, um, and, and there are incidents. Incidents do happen, and I, I've also I've been thankful to see when we've had the appropriate controls and documentation and evidence what a benefit that is uh, to be able to get through incidents you, you know more quickly and uh you know, without uh you know major major issues or damage to the patients or reputation or fines or what have you so um, good good all right well let's let's continue because we we might think you know hipaa is uh, demanding enough uh but there's even more and uh, globally, it's interesting that we have uh, GDPR. And I think many of us here on the call may think we can tune out for this slide because uh, we're based in the United States and we see patients in the United States. But I, I understand, Chris, that we actually do need to pay attention that if we're an organization that even has a web presence that can be accessed by um, international residents or, or even some other factors that we can be drawn in to at least some of the elements of, of GDPR. And we even have here states in the United States like California that have implemented GDPR-like legislation that uh, we need to be aware of. So can you help us uh, understand why this is important for us to pay attention to? Yeah, if you think about the COVID-19 pandemic for a minute, and you think about the rush to try to help people survive, uh, let alone not get the disease in the first place, but treat them in the, in the point of care where they need to be treated, uh, a lot of companies in the U.S. have been asked to help globally apply some of the technologies and some of the services abroad. So it's, it's, it's definitely more than, hey, I've got a website, I'm trying to engage digitally the uh, patient population in my region. Uh, if I've got a, a citizen that's in the EU uh, and they reach out to my website, you're right, I've, I've now got to start thinking about that. But even more urgently, if we're working to try to solve a problem, if we're trying to, to bring a therapeutic to some kind of a, a use case around COVID, and, and we're part of that supply chain or part of that effort, then by, by all means, we have to think about what applies to us as a processor, as a sub-processor of the data. We have to, to understand what state-of-the-art principles are. A lot of times that's left to, to 
uh, some other type of, of uh, standard, ISO 27001, for example. But there are, are other things around data locality concerns and you know, how you keep track of that data throughout its life cycle that you have to think about. And certainly the fines are, are very onerous uh, at this point in time and, and from the beginning rather. It's interesting, I think just yesterday we crossed the two year birthday of GDPR. So in the first two years, they've definitely had some, some really onerous fines go out. Right, you know, Chris, I know in the United States for HIPAA, there's been some relaxation to allow for the rapid rollout of telemedicine have you seen any relaxation or, or uh, flexibility with GDPR? Yeah, I've seen some of the privacy protections rolled back a bit. Uh, uh, Slovakia, for example, uh, was one of those that I talked, of, talked about earlier, where they have loosened the restrictions on privacy to contract contact tracing. Uh, you've also seen uh, companies like Apple and Google work to try to collaborate on using technology to do some, some contact tracing. And that's, that's over the world because they can control 99% or so of the mobile phone operating systems. They have the ability to do that. So certainly there are other concerns around privacy and uh, what happens with that data and, and who gets to know who you've been in touch with and who you have a social network with. Uh, beyond what Facebook already has. So, absolutely. Good. All right. Well, let's, you know, I, I think it's, it's helpful to do a little bit of a compare and um, contrast. And as we, you know, broadly, we might think, well, you know, it's more of a geography thing, right? So, the United States has HIPAA, and that's what we work with. And, and then there are analogs or parallels um, across to GDPR for the European Union. But I think as we, as we peel this back, actually there, there are some important differences. Uh, I think you know, one of the big differences I, I re recognize, of course, is the scope of the data that is addressed, where as um, US citizens you know, don't really have um, comprehensive legislation uh, protecting all data, we have HIPAA, which focuses on health data, health information, uh, whereas GDPR is far broader in that it deals with all data, so non-health data, and if you see in the lower right here of this particular screen, for instance, union information and uh, religion and um, you know, all kinds of things um, are included and all kinds of business organizations or relationships that an individual has um, are covered by GDPR. Um, are, are there some other things that we should be thinking about, Chris, uh, highlights from this chart or other comments that, that would be some compare and contrast? Well, I think it's, it's hard enough for a technology company, a, a healthcare provider, or, or part of that ecosystem to understand what data constitutes HIPAA regulated data. Uh, it, it has to cross through what we call the treatment payment or operations related to healthcare delivery. Uh, GDPR actually does a pretty good job of defining sensitive personal data. It doesn't really matter in what context that data is. If, it, if it's one of those things, it's sensitive. And so in, in a way, I do like how uh, GDPR has, has, has defined what data is. It, it just eliminates a lot of confusion. I would say that you covered it really well, uh, for sure. I think, uh, you know, going into business with someone who has to comply with both GDPR and HIPAA. Uh, there are two different agreements that you need to think about. One is that business associate agreement that is mandated by the uh, HHS in HIPAA uh, for the US. And then of course, thinking about your data processing agreement, uh, which serves a similar purpose, but outlines the technical and organizational measures by which you uh, agree to comply with uh, throughout that data life cycle. So I, I think you've covered it really well, though, Scott. Good. Okay. Thank you, Chris. So, you, you know, um, we want to be uh, compliant, and, and we want to, first, I think, and foremost, I encourage our own team and, and have to just ethically steward people's sensitive data. That's just the right thing to do. Um, 
beyond that, though, there there are some big penalties, um, Chris. I, I think you have you've tracked this. There's the um, uh, there's the wall of shame that is listed. The public website. Um, can you highlight some of the penalties that you've seen over the years? Yeah, we I report these numbers to uh, not only some of our key customers every quarter, but also to our executive leadership and our board. Uh, and I feel my heart goes out to to these organizations that have been the victim of a of a data breach. Some of the largest ones, uh, you know, that you see on the screen here, you know, they're still figuring out how to how to fully remediate all of the the reputational issues and and and, and they're spending lots of money trying to to rebuild certain of their uh, IT assets and their IT systems and and a lot of that is facilitating move to the cloud. Um, but but I would say yeah, the, the the challenge is keeping that data safe, understanding how to protect it. And it, it's just, it, it breaks my heart to see a patient record be uh, compromised because that patient record represents a human being, a, a mother, a, a, a son, a daughter, you know, grandma, whoever that is now has to live not only with the, the treatment issues that they're going through through the health system, but, but also now think about how their record might be used for fraudulent purposes. So uh, my, my heart goes out to them. It also goes out to these organizations that have suffered some of these, these, um, these breaches. Good. Right. Thank you. You know, um, we have seen some, some very uh, sophisticated customers uh, who have um, you know, well-constructed uh, compliance organizations and security teams and infrastructure teams, et cetera. We've still seen them um, ask for help. And I, I think that's been interesting. You know, even particularly lately, I, I mentioned some of the COVID projects that uh, if you're trying to build uh, some new hospital beds, you know, outside your normal facilities, that takes a lot of work. And you, you're, you're doing a student body left, if you will, with your resources, shifting resources to deal with that, or um, trying to under, better understand your supply chain to make sure that you've got enough uh, PPE, the protective equipment to take care of your frontline staff, et cetera. So we, we have seen some challenges in, in getting the right resources. Uh, we've also seen, uh, because of these economic uh, times of furloughs and you just don't have the numbers uh, of of the staff um, and then all of that you have this pressure to still move really quickly because you need to implement solutions really quickly some of those are reconnecting with your patients now that you, you in, in some areas you're able to restart elective procedures and, and uh, provider organizations for instance desperately need that elective procedure revenue in order to put people back to work and, and of course take care of their communities um, but with that rush to implement, um, you know, there's times when you know you don't necessarily have all of the technical expertise, et cetera, to uh, bring to bear and make sure you're also taking care of the privacy, security, and, and compliance. What, what else are you seeing, Chris, in terms of needs for uh, compliance support? Well, it, 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 it's a, it's an interesting topic, Scott. There's a lot of folks who very sophisticated customers, like you mentioned, reach out and say, help us understand how to implement DevSecOps so that we can better engage the patient. We can deliver what we can to the, to the patient as quickly as we can, or we can support the covered entity or the, the healthcare provider in delivering the care. Uh, so as, as soon as you start to say, hey, I really don't understand how to do this DevSecOps and, and understand how to bake privacy and security by design into the process, you may want to reach out to a third party to get some help. Uh, you might be getting requests about GDPR and uh, understanding that as it, as it relates to your workloads and, and your patients and your customers. Maybe you're also thinking about how do I comply with the, the CCPA in California? Well, fortunately, we all know that uh, California carved out health data uh, to, to at least prevent some of that confusion uh, early on. We'll see what continues to happen there. Maybe your data may not be where you thought it is. Maybe you're going through a risk assessment and you don't necessarily have a, a good handle on where all of your PHI or your sensitive personal data is. And so you, you need to, to 
to document and track that. So some of these are the, are the items that I would see as, as signs that you might need some third party assistance. Um, it's important to bring a metaphor to bear, Scott, if you will. The, the climb to Mount Everest is rarely done without the help of a Sherpa, and there's nothing wrong with reaching out and getting that help. Good, good. Well, thanks, Chris. You know, we do hear about this term of, of, of parts of, of the public cloud, for instance, um, are HIPAA eligible. So there's some super, you know, very secure building blocks, let's call them, that um, can be used as HIPAA eligible. Uh, then we also, though, think about, well, wait a minute, does that make me HIPAA compliant? Um, there, there's a difference here. Um, and can you help us, you know, kind of tease that apart, Chris, of when, when something is HIPAA eligible, uh, what I hear is you are, you have permission to use that for handling uh, PHI, protected health information. Um, however, the way I understand it is you still have to configure that and use it in the right way and keep using it in the right way and you know, have controls in place and evidence, et cetera, um, in order to, to make sure that it's really compliant. Um, is that right? Or maybe can you add some more color to that, Chris? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right, Scott. The HIPAA eligible service that you look at on a public cloud provider's website, uh, hey, they'll list a whole bunch of services and a whole bunch of, uh, of, of types of, of infrastructure elements that they have gone through and they've done some great testing. And that's one of the beauties of, of, of public cloud providers is they've done a lot of this work. They understand that a, uh, a storage bucket should be have the ability to be encrypted so that you don't leak data that is sensitive about patients. They, they understand that, that a, uh, an API uh, that, that, that is needing a gateway or some kind of a tool to, to process and, and throttle the calls and, and help understand and, and authorize the, the access to those APIs. Those are very important and they've, they've done a lot of that legwork, but to your point, you still have to configure them in a way that doesn't open a hole or fail to implement one of the configurations that needs to happen to make that uh, not only uh, useful to you as a customer or a, an organization, but also compliant with HIPAA. A lot of folks have done this in the past and, and you know, to, to their own demise, they have stepped on the ladder wrong, crossing the chasm and they've fallen to go back to that metaphor on Everest, uh, and it's just something you have to be very, very careful about, and you have to really understand what you're doing. Okay. Well, let's just do. Let's take a little friendly quiz here. Uh, so, if a cloud service is HIPAA eligible, a healthcare organization can use it to store and transmit PHI and be in compliance. Is that you know is that a true statement or a, or a false statement? Uh, it's true and false. I think that was a <laughs> help us there. Was a trick, true and false. Trick question. Yeah. Uh, again, if you use a HIPAA eligible for service, you have to configure it in a way that complies with the HIPAA security rule to be used, and that is uh, uh, absolutely can can happen if you do it correctly, and it can also not happen if you happen to misconfigure it or fail to understand some of the nuances of infrastructure as code. Okay, well, let's, let's keep this a good idea. Let's keep moving along here with a couple of more uh, questions, like starting in the upper left here. Um, can a cloud organization use any cloud service that they want? It's probably a pretty easy one. What do you think? Well, sure. The question is, do they want a, a data breach or not? So if they, if they see that menu of, of cloud services and, and offerings, uh, first of all, look for the ones that are HIPAA eligible. Those are where you want to start. And secondly, um, you know, make sure that when you do use that, you configure it the way you need it. Right. You know, here's, here's another little twist on that, I think, Chris, is that not everything a healthcare organization does relates to PHI. So for instance, if right. they had, you know, potentially it's your supply chain or other elements of your organization, uh, or you may be dealing even with, you know, some consumer data, for instance, that isn't 
part of the, the HIPAA relationship. Um, in that case, they can use services that are not even HIPAA eligible, even though they're a healthcare organization, because the PHI is not flowing through them. Um, so, yeah, and, and I, I know that we've, we've helped organizations do that. So, and these are part of the subtleties that I think are really important. Um, all right, uh, second up in the upper right here, if a service is marked as HIPAA eligible, is it okay to use it with PHI? Conditionally, yes. If, again, if you have uh, configured the environment to have encryption in transit throughout, uh, if you have uh, the defensive depth, de defense in depth principles applied where you've got vulnerability management and you've got uh, everything configured that way, if you've got your backups going, if you've got your uh, vulnerability tools in place, if you've got your system activity reviews happening and you've got your logs flowing and being protected, probably. It just depends, again, on how you configure it. Right, okay. And I think you then have answered that one in the lower right, uh, but how about the one in the lower left here? What are my options if I want to maintain compliance in the cloud? It's, a, it's designed to be easy in theory, but it's more difficult than you would imagine. Your options are to understand, of course, how you interpret a regulation that was written in 1996 evolved to some degree over the years uh, and then of course the high tech act as well uh, it helps interpret some of those concepts into a modern day cloud architecture using modern day devsecops uh, processes and continuous integration continuous deployment of code uh, strategies so you, if you if you take all of that you can bind the interpretations that you have, and then you build the technical controls that are required to make sure that you are HIPAA compliant for all of those uh, different technical safeguards, then, then you can use uh, the cloud for HIPAA compliant workloads. Uh, but again, that takes work, that takes you away from some of your, autom your, your own innovation, if you will, and uh, it, it can be a, a real headwind uh, for cloud adoption. Okay, you talked some about controls, Chris, and I want us to take some more look at that. Um, you, you know, what do we mean by controls related to uh, cloud services? You, you, you mentioned a couple of these things. If you can elaborate, I think that'll be helpful for us to give some more specific examples. Sure, yeah, if we think about encryption, the, the addressable standard uh, from the HIPAA security rule. Uh, you could certainly apply encryption in a way that doesn't really serve you well. And, you know, for example, all you, may, maybe all you're doing to, to store your data is using some kind of a volume on a compute instance in the cloud. And you, you say, hey, I've got this database full of, of PHI and putting it there and I'm going to just simply encrypt the volume. Well, that doesn't really help secure the data if, if you have uh, potentially a malicious insider that can just simply access everything on that volume. So you put things in place that can be preventative in nature, detective in nature, uh, that can help you recover from things like ransomware incidents by putting technical controls or technical features in place that do things on your behalf. Uh, network restrictions is one, uh, identity and access management restrictions is another. Really, there's, there's, you know, we've mapped in, you know, 230 plus controls over 70 different cloud services over the years to to address some of these requirements. And and, and I'll tell you, it's it's been a, a, a long journey to do that. But a policy written in Microsoft Word does not replace a policy written in JSON in, a, in an infrastructure as code deployment. It just doesn't enforce that. Got it. Well, but it's a, it's a pretty unique mix of skills then, Chris, is what I'm hearing, because you have to have the understanding of the legislation and uh, what it means for the data and the data flows. And then, as you just mentioned, you, you really have to kind of trace and transfer that all the way into, you know, automated hardening. Uh, so, uh, good, good. Yeah. Um, with that in mind, you know, I think it's important to understand, you know, who, who is Clear Data? What, what do we do? And it, it's really external organizations have recognized um, clear data as a leader in cloud. So there's a few examples here. Just very recently, 
a MedTech Breakthrough Award for Healthcare Cybersecurity. It was uh, just, just a matter of weeks ago, and we've had some entrepreneurial leadership um, awards as well from Entrepreneur Magazine and Innovation from Fast Company, you see here as well. So it's we're thankful to have that an external recognition for what we do as a healthcare cloud leader. And, and just to put it succinctly, we do help protect healthcare data. So for healthcare life science organizations um, in the cloud, um, and both PHI and this HIPAA terminology and PII, uh, uh, and ultimately really helping uh, organizations innovate in the cloud. So I'm thankful to be a part of Clear Data and, and help some of those, address some of those controls that you mentioned before. And in fact, I think this is a, a good way of our approach, you know, there's different uh, ways of, of, of wrestling with these controls and applying them to the cloud in order to become compliant. But I think it's a really clear way of, of, of expressing it. Um, from a clear data perspective, on the upper left, we start, we automate, Chris, as you described in JSON or whatever that um, automation method is, we take those necessary controls, understand them and apply them um, in code so that somebody can quickly then uh, in the end, on their own, use um, native APIs in the cloud or use native cloud consoles like, uh, and just, just start using it and start taking advantage of those things. And we'll automate all of the hardening and application of those controls. And then on the upper right, there are instances where somebody, uh, uh, whether it's a cloud engineer, application engineer, or, or, or code that they've developed can uh, uh, cause the cloud to drift. It's, it's one of the beauties of the cloud is very, very flexible. But from a compliance perspective, that actually adds additional complexity because uh, the, the, the cloud can drift out of compliance. And uh, Clear Data has the ability to remediate or bring uh, services uh, and reapply controls, which is uh, important. And then there's this issue of evidence. I know um, I actually grew to appreciate auditors in my time as a provider leader because they um, forced me to make sure that there was documentation and that there was evidence that I was actually following the, the policy or procedure that was required. Um, Clear Data absolutely helps with that because there's this demonstration, there's this bolus of evidence uh, that you can see real time in a screen, um, as well as have ac um, uh, um, access to information from prior periods and the ability to ex export that via PDF, et cetera. All this on the lower left in the middle um, allows healthcare organizations really not to focus as much on the plumbing and, and the, uh, of, of the cloud, but it allows them to accelerate in the end um, uh, healthcare impacting innovation. So how, how do we cure COVID? How do we contact trace? How do we capture information in electronic medical record and exchange that and, and have better connectivity with patients and physicians in this digital world and have uh, apply um, AI and ML to data? That's what we want to be able to do in order to, to reform healthcare and, and uh, clear data. This is the part that, that we play in, in that effort. Um, you know, with that in mind, Chris, um, can you, you know, as we peel this back, help us understand uh, how that works? You know, how do the controls and principles apply here? How, do, how does Clear Data do this? Yeah, Scott. So you you, you described it well in, in terms of that circle slide. I did I did like how you you, you talked about having the controls in place, interpreting the, the regulation. What I like to start with is certainly understanding the, the regulation. It's, it's really important to know that if you go to France, you probably don't want to put your data there or store your data there unless you have certain certifications issued by the government. If you, if you violate that, for example, you may go to prison. And from what I hear, prison changes a person. Um, but, but in seriousness, if you think about HIPAA, you think about GDPR, ISO, et cetera, you need to understand what those requirements are. You need to then take on the right side of the slide the cloud service that you want to use. In our case, Clear Data listens to our customers and to the market, and we apply or we create technical controls that align the regulation with the specific cloud service so that when you do use it, you can use it in a way that's not only HIPAA eligible, but is, 
as, as hardened and pre-configured as possible so that you can almost use it out of the box uh, without having to uh, do much configuration at all. Uh, again, it's a, it's a powerful way to do it. I did mention GDPR just a few minutes ago. We have a, a question, Scott, I wanna answer from the audience, from Jacob. Uh, and Jacob's question was really, does, does GDPR's right to be forgotten apply to de-identified patient data used for research? The answer is if it's, if it's really de-identified, uh, then, then it's really not uh, identifiable data that, and it would be excluded. The, the real question though is can it be re-identified and there's there's great debate that happens and that, that, that's happening now on exactly uh, how can that data be re-identified using the things you just talked about like artificial intelligence machine learning other kinds of information uh, you know so so I hope that helps Jacob um, but but uh, yeah Scott so this is one of the ways that we apply uh, regulations to the services to the to the controls. Good. I noticed another question here. It relates to that lower left hand corner. We see GXP there, and um, Chris, we um, support GXP. That's a complex topic, though, because uh, you know there, I think there's interplay between the customer's quality management uh, system and the application, and there's many, many layers to that. So can you talk about some of the foundational controls that we have that support an organization's um, application of, uh, of GXP and how we do that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, Minaj asked the same type of question around, you know, do we provide 21 CFR Part 11 compliance service as well? And, and certainly uh, good manufacturing processes go beyond just that. And uh, it, it's certainly a broader topic. So yes, clear data works with customers who need those kinds of, of rigor and, and those kinds of controls. Uh, we do align to not only the FDA side of the world, but to, to really create a baseline, we align really to ISO 13485 that allows us to, to build the, the controls, the traceability, the change requirements, uh, the, the documentation necessary to support some of those workloads. Uh, it, it's really an important marketplace. It's an important part of the healthcare ecosystem. And many, many customers uh, over time have, have built an application that then becomes part of a decision-making process for health treatment. And, and quickly and easily, the developers can, can fall into FDA type of regulatory requirements. So uh, very important to understand that before going in. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Uh, so that was the PowerPoint view, Chris, of, of this application from the regulatory regime to the controls to the cloud services you just walked us through. I think it's interesting to see that, you know, beyond the PowerPoint, there's actually a solution. And in this case, this is our uh, Clear Data's Comply platform. And one of the things I've found very helpful is um, the traceability that is, is quite explicit. So for instance, um, in this particular slide that we see here, this is just one example, and we could, you know, we could look at AWS or um, Azure or Google's cloud, and there are you know, many different elements that we could look at here. But in this, in this visualization here, we have just what you described in the slide in software. So we have the HIPAA regulation highlighted, the uh, 45 CFR 164, and, and that is highlighted. And then we have to the left, what does that mean? Uh, and we have clear data's interpretation and that's, it's not an opaque interpretation, it's an explicit interpretation of what that means. And then as it goes down, we see audit logging is highlighted here, for instance, we see, well, how do we specifically apply that legislation traced to our interpretation and applying it specifically to um, Azure Container Registry and what it means. And so I, I think that explicit traceability is helpful for customers uh, to have confidence as they're configuring and operating a system, but also very importantly um, for auditors or others that need evidence, it's all very uh, visible here for them. So uh, it's a way of, of actually embodying those concepts into software. Yeah, and I'll comment, Scott, you have really good eyes because I could hardly see that screen, but uh, okay. uh, kudos to your eye health. 
uh, good to your point, it, it, it also helps the, the developers. You know, when they start to develop a service, wouldn't it be nice for them to understand, hey, if I've got to comply with this requirement, this is how this cloud service should be used or configured. Absolutely. Good. Now, there are some pitfalls, some, some very common mistakes, Chris, and I uh, would like you to, to help us understand, you know, particularly you, you've talked about um, DevOps and automation and CI, CD. I mean, we, we want to be moving fast and use the, the latest development the tools, the latest development methods, um, but there's some ways that we can get um, uh, tripped up. So um, if you can help us with that, uh, what are some of these common mistakes? One of the things that allows you to prepare for a threat is to model a threat. And what that really means is sit down, take a look at your workload, take a look at your application and how it's being used, and try to come up with different threats that could be exploited against that workload or that application. Doing that is really the first step. Once you figure out your threats, once you've modeled what they could be, then start to create some plans around how to mitigate those threats. That's the number one thing you can do to prepare is to not wait for a threat to happen, but to really sit down, model it beforehand, and, and try to come up with a game plan to, to prevent it from ever happening. By the way, I will, uh, I will say this, and I, I love people, I'm a people person, but people are the greatest risk usually in any kind of a technology that, that needs to secure sensitive information. It's just wrought with uh, potential misconfigurations and things like that. So keep people in that threat modeling scenario as well. That's what I would say. Good. All right. Well, I know time is tight, so I'll want to help us move through these next four um, elements, if you can help us, Chris. Yeah, data sprawl. We mentioned PHI inventory. We, we mentioned understanding where your data is at. I would encourage those of you listening to, to go to the, the datamap.org. It's a, it's a project by Harvard that is trying to map the data stopping points throughout the treatment care cycle. It's fascinating. There's probably over 100 places your data goes with one visit to a doctor. So understanding that from a covered entity or a provider perspective, understanding how your data flows from a uh, technology partner perspective, very, very hard to, to do unless you have the right tools, the right partners, the right help. Uh, but if you don't know where your PHI or your sensitive personal data is, how on earth are you going to protect it? You really have to get that down. Right. In our because third configuration, yes. Uh, that one is a, a classic. Again, if you have relied upon humans to configure all of your cloud infrastructure every time, they're likely to make a mistake. And so wherever you can, if you can remove manual steps from the process and use automation, cloud makes it very, relatively very easy to do, then HIPAA compliance is, is not as hard, is not as difficult as it, as it may be if you do it manually. So misconfiguration certainly is one of the biggest causes of the biggest data breaches in the history. Got it. All right. And fourth? Yeah, we talked about automation. If you have a threat model and you know some of the threats that might happen, build automation to prevent those threats from happening. Use third-party tools that can help you uh, prevent something from happening. If you, again, can eliminate the human element from it, humans still need to help write the code. Uh, so, so humans are still very important. But when they do write that code, it's important to check that work using automation as well going back to the DevSecOps uh, life cycle. Right. And resources are tight. So how about this one? Resources are tight, and they seem to be getting tighter even without the, the COVID-19 issue. You do have to have someone accountable for the data uh, stewardship. In fact, the HIPAA security rule requires it. Uh, you have to have a, a HIPAA security official that is designated in GDPR world, you have to have a data protection officer that reports to the highest level of the organization, and, and certainly you can't just fire that person because you don't like what they have said about you and your protection of data. There's, there's actual legislation that prohibits some of that. So 
not a place to scrimp on budget, uh, even where it's tight. Obviously, you have to uh, do what you can and be reasonable about your spend. But uh, this is this is one of those areas that we have to think about. Got it. Helpful. Th thanks, Chris. And yeah, I'm, I expect you see all five of these frequently. I do. Absolutely. On a regular basis, for sure. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, this is an interesting um, concept here, this, this advantage of, of DevSecOps. So it's, it's adding the sec, if you will. And we could probably spend, in fact, we probably should, Chris, you and I have another, a full another session on this topic. But um, maybe if you could just uh, introduce the concept here. Yeah, it, it's a complex model, not so much to look at, but to practice. So on the left side, if you think about the build process, you need to start your, your development with a, uh, a code analysis. When you start with your, your plan right there in the middle, you start to code, you do your static analysis. That means you run some automation against your code. You then have someone do a code review. And then as you're building, you do a penetration test right, right before you, you start the release process. You make sure that there's no holes in the application. Then you make sure that you validate the compliance against the regulations by which you have to, uh, to comply. And then you start the release process. You, you have to then start logging this, uh, this stuff in a way that it's traceable. You, you then have to deploy that into production. It gets more difficult. Then you start to apply all of the, the, the threat intelligence, the monitoring, the operations, detect, detection, response, and then you start monitoring. And then you start to do the process all over again. It's a, it's a never ending loop. It's designed that way to be uh, DevSecOps in perpetuity. And that takes a lot of work and, and discipline and organizational uh, culture and, and those kinds of considerations. Well, that, that probably you know, really brings us to this other topic of, Chris, which you just explained. I mean, DevSecOps makes a lot of sense. It's, it's woven into the process as opposed to sort of a, you know, a, an afterthought that's kind of bolted on or stuck on. And um, that seems to be an area where, you know, others can turn to who people have been doing that for years or have done it hundreds of times. And uh, that, that, I think those are examples. Of, of where third parties can help address those five things, those common mistakes, or help uh, an organization move into this um, DevSecOps uh, world. Are there other thoughts, uh, Chris, on how where third parties can help? Yeah, we had a, well, just before we get to that, we had another uh, attendee uh, ask the question, where does two-factor authentication fit in all of these? And, and certainly we didn't call out every control, but that is one of the most important controls uh, especially if you start to think about APIs and how they consume data and how you can, uh, you know, depending upon what the API is, uh, you, how, how you can help secure some of those, uh, those, those, those tooling uh, areas. Uh, but it, MFA, multi-factor authentication, has prevented an innumerable number of breaches uh, because of that. So great call out. Uh, don't forget to have the two-factor two authentication. Coming back, Scott, how can third-party expertise help? Uh, again, if you if you live this stuff, if you go through it uh, on a daily basis, and you start to have some of these challenges, um, please reach out and ask for help. Um, okay. Third parties can do everything from help you form your code to help you provision your cloud services to how to secure your containers, how to leverage microservice types of uh, architecture, and, and even get into the serverless technology as things start to continue to evolve. Uh, but, but really rely on those third parties. They can certainly help. Good. Well, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll close by highlighting that um, Clear Data is a resource. We're, we're eager to, to speak with you. Uh, and to, to be a resource to help. And I think our perspective of automation uh, and the solution which helps remediate if the cloud drifts, the ability to demonstrate and provide evidence both real time on a dashboard and then uh, going back, um, all with a mind of accelerating solutions uh, in this very important time to push back the global pandemic and and help routine care uh, uh, be executed again 
uh, we're eager to help. So would want to uh, invite those attendees to reach back out to us and uh, uh, contact uh, us here at Clear Data and further dis the, the discussion. We're interested to hear about the issues that you're wrestling with, the problems that you're trying to solve in healthcare, and uh, how we can how we can help you. So with that, Chris, really appreciates uh, your insights and your comments and the knowledge that you have in this space and, and sharing some of those with the, the group today. Um, very much appreciate it and uh, look forward to talking with you and with our attendees again. So thank you all.